You just met my tornado. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> oh, I, I'm so, so happy to be here tonight, and I want to thank everyone who made it possible. Um, I, I'm so excited that I'm going to have to do like three things. One of them's not terrible. Um, one set a timer because I get too excited and I'll just keep talking and then it'll be morning. And you guys will be trying to get out, but I'll be talking by those doors. Um, and then the other thing I have to do when I'm um, nervous is <clears throat> I, I always like to sing because singing's the scariest thing you can do in front of people. And if you're already scared, what the hell, right? Um, it's sort of like when I was, uh, in, uh, when I was like, in my early 20s and uh, I went through my first breakup, like the one that you don't know that you're gonna survive, you know, that where you're just like, you sleep with your clothes and your shoes and your car keys in case they call and wanna, they changed their mind, and um, and I would wake up in you know at all times and look in the mirror and it looked like Mrs. Potato Head looking back and we're both crying, and all, all of a sudden one morning I went I should get my wisdom teeth out because I already look like hell and feel like hell and I knew they'd give me painkillers so. Um, <laughs> If some of you young people have your wisdom teeth and you haven't gone through that breakup yet, hang on to them, you know. Um, so the little song I'm going to sing, and, and then I'm also interested in singing, better bad singing than no singing at all. It's to the tune of Coal Miner's Daughter. It's a little bit about me. And then um, by then, after that, uh, it'll just be fabulous. Okay, here, I'm just going to do it. It's only one verse. I was born a meat cutter's daughter. My mom is from the Philippines. She was a janitor. I ate TV dinners at night. I grew up by the TV light while dad drank vodka in the basement and mom hollered. So the part that I like about singing that song, oh, thank you. No, uh, thank you. Um, the part I like about, sing about singing that song and why I kind of wanted the house lights up, because my favorite moment is when I say my mom is from the Philippines and I can see sort of the confused <laughs> German shepherd look on your face, like, oh, she doesn't look Filipino. And I always tell people it's because I'm a quarter Norwegian and Norwegian blood can suck the color out of anything. <laughs> um, if you, if you have a shirt with a stubborn stain and you know someone who's 100% Norwegian, you can just bring it to them and just say, pass your hand over this <laughs> three times. But I'll show you. See if you can pick me out. <laughs> it's me and my cousins. And um, I'm going to talk to you about images and about, um, and about what their function might be, but I want to talk a little bit about growing up in this family um, with my grandma. And this is what Tagalog sounds like. Matigasang ulo ni Linda nakopo, which already blew your mind, right? And it means hard is the head of Linda. Oh my. Um, <laughs> But my grandma, I realize now, since I've done all this study about images and how we get one idea into the body of another, I realize that I grew up with this little Filipino lady who had a very interesting idea about um, how you get kids to do what you want. So she, this was an example. She'd say, you know, Linda, everybody, God has made everybody a castle made of gold. It's up in heaven. Oh, it's beautiful. But every time you are bad, he takes one brick. And your castle is getting very small, okay? <laughs> that was one image that I had in my head, like, shit, how big's my castle now? Um, and uh, the other thing she'd say is, you know, in the Philippines, there is a vampire. Do you know this vampire? It's called the Aswang. It is, um, during the day, it's a dog. It, uh, you can always tell because the back legs are very high, the front legs are short. But at night, it turns into a beautiful woman. Oh, she's so pretty. And she takes her legs off, and I always thought, and leaves them where? But she takes the legs off. I always imagine leaning them against the wall, right? And then she's flying. She comes to America. She's looking for our house. You know, sometimes we watch the TV and it, the picture is jumping. That's the aswang on the antenna. She comes here to our house and she can come through the door and she comes and she crawls on the ceiling already. You're like, uh, crawling on the ceiling, looking for your room, Linda. Your room, she comes, she finds your room, she's hanging. And she looks down 
and she has a long tongue with a needle on the end. And she's putting it down to suck all your blood because you don't pick up your clothes. <laughs> right? It wasn't until years later when I started to understand how memory works and how images work that it's a real different thing when you think there's a vampire and also kind of thrilled that one thought so much of me that she'd suck my blood personally um, and to get you to clean up your, uh, your room. So I, um, I want to talk to you about this, uh, uh, my work and this question that I've had uh, that I started um, asking when I was 19 years old and I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And I, it's a very good school. And I met my teacher, Marilyn Frasca, um, to get into Evergreen. I don't know if you know about Evergreen. Evergreen was a school that um, it's when it was built in 72 when everybody thought hippies were here to stay. And the legislator in, in Washington State said, the legislature said, we, I think we need a college for hippies. And they went, yeah, I think we do too, man. So they built one, you know, not putting two and two together that hippies like, the terminal degree is hacky sack. I mean, there's like, you know, there's no... So they couldn't get anyone to come to the school. It was a hippie school. So they were letting anyone in. And that's how I was able to go to college. And, um, and my entrance exam was index card, Elmer's glue, peace sign, lentils, full scholarship. And so uh, <laughs> I met my teacher there who asked this question that's sort of been guiding my work ever since, and it's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And her question was, what is an image? And I think what she's talking about, it's kind of the thing when I was telling you the Oswang story, I, one of the things I think about an image is it's anything that, that is contained by the thing that we call the arts. And I'd also say that any object that kids are attached to. But it, the easiest way for me to show you, uh, tell you about an image is to show you what it feels like. So I, um, if you remember your first phone number, because I'm going to count to three and we're all going to say our first phone number together. Ready? One, two, three. PA24435. Oh, that was nice. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three. PA24435. Okay. Now your phone number from three phone numbers ago. Can you feel the difference? It's almost like a physical difference. And if we were doing a functional MRI of your brain, which I wish I can't wait till I have a portable one that I can just lay on people's heads, it's just, it's just wear it for a second. Um, uh, we'd see a completely different signature in the brain. That w the three phone numbers ago is a kind of thinking. Um, the other is spontaneous. So the first thing about an image is it, it's kind of spontaneous. The other thing is that it feels somehow alive. When you all said your first phone number, <laughs> I loved looking at the audience because everybody did, does this afterwards. <laughs> like you all did it. You even have to look at each other like. <laughs> and then there are a couple people who can't remember. Like, social security number, first phone number. OK, so that's one thing. It feels kind of alive. Um, and another thing about it is, is it, it's specific. Um, uh, OK, so how can I explain that specific? Um, for instance, um, when I was a kid, I had heard about uh, imaginary friends. You guys probably heard about imaginary friends. And I wanted one really bad, but I didn't know how you got one. What do you do? Like, you know, and then one day I just realized I could lie. You know, I just lie about having one. Who's, and then I realized that me meant I had an imaginary, imaginary friend, <laughs> which isn't as good as a, a real imaginary friend. And I had a friend who had a real one, and this is the way I knew uh, this imaginary friend was real. It was the, in the specificity. First of all, the imaginary friend's name was Sprinkles, which is lame. You wouldn't choose that unless it was real to you. But the most important thing is she could only communicate with sprinkles through a moving fan. Hello, sprinkles. I mean, you can't make that shit up, right? I mean, you can't make that up. <laughs> so it's specific. Um, the, the other thing about it is um, it's unplanned. Um, and, it and it's more tied with play than it is with um, how we think we're supposed to write a novel. For instance, when I sat down with my uh, dolls, Barbie and Ken, I didn't say, Barbie, Ken, we're about to play. It's going to be a three act. Uh, we'll start, there'll be an attraction. Uh, third act, there'll be a conflict. Maybe another Ken doll comes in. You both have strong feelings for him. <laughs> and then in this last one, uh, resolution somehow, and then the denouement. Let's play. Um, that's not how it works at all. In fact, kids kind of don't know when they're slipping into play. And as adults, we start to confuse play with fun. 
And um, when kids are in deep play, here's another clue about images. Um, when kids are in deep play, a state of deep play, and adults are in creative concentration, at least from the viewpoint of an fMRI, which, by the way, is n it's hard to know what an fMRI is measuring and that you can set the thresholds any way you want, but, but there are certain signatures that look very, look very similar. So that was another clue to me about what images might be doing. And um, when, when <laughs> I was, so I do this thing where, because it's the first time in human history that mothers and dads have something more compelling to look at than their child's face, which is this little digital device. And kids also have something more compelling if they have a digital device. So I time people. I like to time eye contact between parents and kids when one has a digital device and when they don't. So I'm timing this I'm at, at breakfast. There's a kid, he's about, I don't know, about four. Mom's over here and she's on her device doing this. He's eating. Kids always try for eye contact. They're not, they're not getting it because that device really requires a certain kind of focus. And so I look over and then I see kids. They'll fall into a state of play. So he's eating gives up on mom, he's picking up his bacon, and suddenly he goes, I'm gonna eat you, <laughs> right? And then he does the bacon all scared, no, please, please don't eat me, yes, I'm gonna eat you, you know? And I'm like riveted, how's this gonna come out? You know, and we're, we're all engaged, kids engaged, bacon's engaged, I'm engaged, mom does this, what are you doing? And all of a sudden he has no idea. And I thought that's a perfect example of what it's like when we start to do something, you know, some creative activity. There's this feeling like we're, we're beginning this thing and then there's this voice that goes, what are you doing? And there's, you don't know when that, voice, um, when that voice comes, but I'll tell you a little bit more about what to do about that voice. Um, because I do know some very good strategies for knocking it to the ground and kicking it <coughs> <laughs> repeatedly. Um, so I want to talk to you about this thing that I was saying about uh, images and, um, and what contains them. Um, I, one of the things that, that is amazing to me is um, you've all met kids who have a relationship with an object, like a blankie that they can't stand to be without, or um, some, some toy that they have to have. In fact, if you pay attention to it, you'll notice that kids often, at a certain age, are often carrying something. I saw a kid at the airport who had once had the entire Incredible Hulk doll, but all he had left was the leg. And I was like, the leg's all I need, man! You know, he didn't, he could conjure the whole Hulk from this leg. Well, I had some friends, and by the time we noticed the attachment uh, that a kid has to a blanket, um, it's already happened. And if you think about it, a blanket really is a piece of cloth that contains a character, that somehow that kid, pre-verbal, was, was able to put in there, and then at some point when they're verbal enough, even has a name, and the whole family acknowledges um, this thing. So I had some friends who, whose, whose kid got uh, attached to what was arguably the ugliest toy ever. Somebody had given this child a stuffed banana with blue eyes and little dangly arms, right? It was ugly, and um, this kid just loved it. So the poor family, no matter where they were, here she's hauling, she called it Mr. Banana. So she's calling Mr. Banana around, she's three, Mr. Banana, that's all right, four, all right, that's cool. Now she's five, still wants Mr. Banana around. Age six, the par Mr. Banana's looking like a junkie at this point, and the parents like are trying to split, you know, I'm sure they talk, we gotta get her off Mr. Banana, I know, how are we gonna do it? And clearly they hadn't read any books about uh, child psychology because they said, oh, I know, we'll do it when we're on vacation, <laughs> right? And so they go to, they go to London, and they're staying in this um, bed and breakfast, and uh, no, they're staying in a hotel, and they convince her, they say, Mr. Banana doesn't want to go out today, he wants to stay in the hotel room. And she's like, no, he doesn't. It's like, yeah, he, he totally does. She's like, no, he doesn't. But they convince her, and so she leaves Mr. Banana, they go out, they have their stroll, I'm sure they're looking at each other like, you know, and they get back to the hotel room, open the door, and the room's been clean, and Mr. Banana is gone. Did you hear that little, like, Oh. It's like, y'all don't even know Mr. Banana, but you're like, no, not Mr. Banana. It's because you do know Mr. Banana, right? So what happens? She starts screaming. She's flipping out. The lights come on for the parents like, oh, hell, this is the beginning of our vacation, and Mr. Banana is gone. So my friend calls down, and luckily the concierge, he also understood the concept of Mr. Banana because my friend said a little while later, uh, the phone rings. He picks it up. Mr. Banana has been found. Right? And then a little while later, 
Sister Banana. And the, and the way she responded to that, and the whole family responded, um, they knew their vacation was saved. <laughs> and, um, but think about that. Mr. Banana really is a piece of polyester with polyester filling. He's also the difference of whether that girl is going to be able to sleep or not that night. That's a clue about one of the things that, um, that images do. And in fact, we as adults, we have our own version of, of Mr. Banana, <laughs> which is if you've um, ever had a book that's just been kicking around your place for a couple of years, and you keep meaning to get to it, and you keep meaning to get to it, and then finally one night you start it, and it turns out that it seems like it's a good book. You know that feeling when you're about 20 pages in? The books, you know, it's almost like falling in love or getting a crush, like, hey, man, this could be a good book. This could, this could work out. And then you're like 40 pages in, it's like, don't mess this up, man, you know? <laughs> and it's a good book, and you're loving it, and you're laying in bed at night, and you're reading, and now you only have 40 pages left. What do you do? You slow down, which is sort of interesting. You slow down because this world that you've been in, this image world is only a quarter of an inch thick. That's all that's left. And then when you finish the book, what do you do? Don't you hold it and look at it and like want to French it? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? This, I mean, there's, you don't just go, hey, I finished that book. There's this weird like, ah, oh, and, um, and because that book went from being an object that didn't contain an image to an object that contains an image. And it's so strong that if you lend that book to one of your friends and they lose it and they buy you a new copy, it's not the same thing. It's, just, it's an old human thing that we do. Um, Another thing about, a, about, a, uh, <laughs> about, an ob uh, about an image is it makes sense to the top of the mind. Uh, no, it, it's satisfying to us, even if it doesn't make sense to the top of the mind. And an example I can give of that is this song um, that I loved by the Young Rascals um, when I was uh, in, in seventh grade. It's called Groovin'. Groovin' on a Sunday afternoon. And there was this one line that I just loved. Um, that would be ecstasy, you and me and Leslie grooving. And I didn't know who Leslie was, but that sounded good to me, right? You and me and Leslie grooving. And I loved how Leslie could be a boy or a girl's name, depending on how I was swinging that year, you know. I was really into this song. So then I get older, and I'm in a car. I'm driving. Car speakers are good. I'm driving. It's like, here comes my song. That would be ecstasy, you and me endlessly grooving. It wasn't you and me and Leslie grooving. It was you and me endlessly grooving. <laughs> Which is the better lyric? It's Leslie, right? <laughs> Leslie is an image. Leslie makes no sense. What's the first thing an editor would take out? Well, Leslie isn't properly introduced and doesn't add to the arc of the story. <laughs> What about endlessly? Endlessly rhymes, it makes sense, and I'd argue also cuts the balls right off the song and throws them out the window. Where? I'm always waiting. And um, <laughs> so the same thing is true about, uh, again, these stories, certain kinds of stories that if they follow this kind of story structure, which, by the way, the only reason we know about story structure is because it already exists. We can write about it because it already exists, and it exists in us, and you'll, you can really see it in, in kids. And um, I've been very interested in kids and their objects, but I realized that I can't just go up to strange kids with their parents and go, would you, could you tell me about your transitional object? I mean, I can't, so what I do is I just start to draw around them, and, and I was on an airplane, um, so I'm window seat, a kid here, he's about eight and his mom, who immediately gets on her little skibbles and starts doing this, puts her earbuds in. Thank God this kid didn't, he had a sticker book. He didn't have a device. So I'm sitting by him, and I start drawing kind of very big, like really drawing, and he looks over and he goes, you can draw. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a cartoonist. He goes, draw something. So I draw a chicken, right? Chicken. And he goes, you are. I go, I know. Um, <laughs> Actually, in the rural community where I live in Wisconsin, everybody kind of knows I do something, but they don't know what, and they've heard I'm a cartoonist, but I, don't, I kind of can't explain to them I'm not that kind of cartoonist. And if I drew that same damn chicken and showed it to them, they'd say, oh, well, everyone has a dream, and that's yours, I guess. <laughs> but, um, but this kid 
the kid's fine with it. So I tell him about this game that nobody invented. We all do it. It's a game where you draw a little scribble and then you pass it to your friend and they make a picture out of it. Then they draw a scribble and back, do it back and forth. If you do that two or three times with a kid, you're going to get a story. And so I'm passing back and forth to this kid and he goes, all of a sudden he goes, ooh, ooh, I have a story and you can make it into a comic strip. Which is when I was a kid, I guess I always thought that's what creative inspiration looked like. Ooh, I have a novel. It's a trilogy. Um, <laughs> which would be wonderful, right? Um, so it, I did make it into a comic strip. It was a very good story. And um, this is the story verbatim. The kid's name was Jack. He goes, the title is, which I also love because he didn't know what the story was yet. He goes, the title is Chicken Attack by Jack. <laughs> so here's the story. One morning, a chicken was eaten by a man. The man went to work. His stomach started to feel funny. He went to the portalet, and then he went. The chicken came out. The man was surprised. The chicken was also surprised. <laughs> the chicken ran from the portalet to the construction site. They put the chicken in charge, and from then on, the chicken was boss. <laughs> right? Isn't that an oddly satisfying story? <laughs> I mean, when, we're time, when, when I'm talking about what the biological function of images might be, I'm talking about what you just went through listening to Chicken Attack by Jack, which is before Chicken Attack by Jack, after Chicken Attack by Jack. <laughs> So, you know, that's really interesting to me, and I was really blown away by it, and everybody thinks I like, wrote such a brilliant strip. But I, got, I said, no, no, really, this kid did write it. And as we're getting off the plane, I say to his mom, you know, we just wrote a comic strip together. I'm a cartoonist. We just wrote a comic strip together. She's looking at me like, sure, menopausal woman, go. Um, <laughs> but then I told her the story while we were waiting, and what happened? She looked at him, and she said, I told you to stop talking about portalettes. Um, <laughs> that was amazing to me, that that was all that she could see. But I'd say that the same thing is true of us. And the studies that I've done about um, some recent stuff about hemispheric differences in the brain, um, there is a part of us, I always call it the top of the mind, and the, uh, I talk about, talk about the top of the mind and the back of the mind, because to say left and right is a little bit too much of a blunt instrument. <laughs> Sorry, I hate to bring in my murderous rage, but I'd need one to split the brain. Anyway, um, uh, but the top of the mind and the back of the mind um, have different attitudes and different ways of looking at things, and I'd say she was a perfect example of the, of the top of the mind. Um, hold it. Oh, it's buzzing. And on, I just got this, and I didn't know you could just have it buzz on your butt. I'm going to do it again. All right, uh, so... So I want to talk just uh, really quick about um, what I think the role of images might be and what they've been for me. Um, the easiest way I can explain, again, it's a metaphor. Um, uh, some of you are familiar probably with this uh, neuroscientist named V.S. Ramachandran. His um, specialty was in, um, well, all kinds of things, but he be was very interested in the phenomenon of phantom limb pain. So you all know what phantom limb pain is, right? You're missing your hand, but you, it's like it's there and it's hurting. I'm positive there's phantom limb pleasure, but no one calls their doctor about it. It's like, doctor, you know my missing hand? It feels it keeps feeling fantastic. I mean, <laughs> we'll never know, right? But we know about the pain because these people are suffering. And this one fellow, and you can see this on YouTube, you can see the guy um, that I'm talking about. This one fellow had a pretty intractable case of phantom limb pain. He was mis missing his hand. But his sensation was not only was his hand there, but it was in a super tight fist that kept clenching and clenching and clenching and clenching. So imagine going through that for about three days, then four months and then four years, and it, starts to, he, it started to erode his feeling that life was worth living. So nobody knew what to do for him. Ramachandran came up with this idea that is now used as, a, as therapy for some of um, these situations, and he built a box. I always think of it as like a big shoebox with a mirror and a hole here. And he asked the guy to put his hand in here and look down, and what he saw was a reflection of his hand. Right? You got it? And then he said, open your hand. And the guy, he explains it. It's so beautiful in the video. He said that he saw his other hand open, 
and it solved the problem. The pain went away, and I believe that's what images do. I believe we wouldn't have hauled this thing that we call the arts through all our evolutionary stages if it didn't have some biological function. And I believe that in all of our lives, in everyone's lives, we have the corollary to phantom limb pain. Uh, maybe your mom died when you were little. Maybe your house caught on fire. Maybe, the, maybe your dad lost his job, or there was just some bully you had to deal with, or you had to deal with the fact that you're an odd duck. Um, I am an odd duck, and we really don't, uh, we don't, it's not fun being an odd duck until a certain point, and then it's gas. Um, <laughs> then there's nothing like it. Um, but I believe that there are so many experiences that we can't think our way out of, and that the only way that we can do it is by seeing our experience uh, reflected. All of you, when you were in junior high, had a song that saved your life, right? And it was a song that you had to play over and over and over again. And sometimes I think of that images are like a mirror box, and sometimes I think they're like dialysis where there is a problem, something going on, and here comes this song by the Young Rascals, Groovin', and for that three minutes, it's as if some part of me rolls through that song and comes back better. And then when the song ends, if you know, you probably, some of you still do it, you just play it over and over and over again until you wear it out. I'd say what Ramachandran came up with qualifies as a medical procedure. And I'd also say that in a funny way, a song or a play or a book also qualifies um, for that. Okay, now let me just see what my notes are. Then I'm gonna show you some slides. Then I'm gonna tell you a joke about balls. Then I'm gonna do a party trick and then you can go. Okay, <laughs> let's see if there is anything else. Oh, one, one last thing I wanted to tell you about, about how images, uh, images can take you places and, and, and change your life. And when I was a kid, I came from, um, Although there we are, it was a very rough house, very poor house, lots of violence, lots of trouble, lots of drinking. It was a very unhappy place to grow up in. No books, but we always got the daily paper. And if you hold my work in any kind of esteem, I'm going to change that for you right now by telling you my favorite comic strip of all time is Family Circus. <laughs> but I love Family Circus, and, and I loved it before I could read. When I was a kid and I'd open that paper and I'd look through that little circle and I'd see Jeffy and Dolly and PJ and Billy, and the dog's name was Barfy, so you knew there was maybe some potential hipness in there. And it was drawn by a man named Bill Keen. We just lost him um, over the summer. Um, and now it's drawn by his son, Jeff. But when I'd look in there, I'd think, you know what? Those kids have it pretty good. It looked really good to me. I, I didn't even read the captions. And I loved on Sundays how you'd, Mommy would give Billy a letter and we'd get to watch him go, you know, follow the dotted lines and the dead grandparents were always looking down going, yeah, Billy, you know. And, and I kind of wanted that. And it was around that same time that I started hearing this this uh, rumor that uh, opera singers, when they hit a certain note, could blow up a glass. Remember that? And you'd hear that or you'd hear great art will make you burst into tears. So I'd be in the kitchen, nobody around, I'd have my milk mug and I'd be going, ah, ah, you know, trying to blow it up. I never could do that. And I always wanted to burst into tears in front of some art, especially if there was some cute dude right you know, like near me who's like, oh, she's so sensitive, I must have hair. Um, <laughs> And uh, it didn't even have to be a dude. I mean, it didn't even have to be a person. It could have been a ficus that was sort of pointing my way. But um, so I traveled around Europe by myself when I was 26. And you know you hear people, yes, I traveled around Europe by myself. I was 26 years old. This is how I traveled around Europe. <laughs> I'm scared of everything. I don't know how to do anything or eat. And I'd write like postcards. I'm having the best time. Um, but I, I would go into galleries and I'd look at pictures and I'd think, just burst into tears, man, and somebody will talk to you. It was a theory. Um, <laughs> and so, sure enough, I met the Uffizi Botticelli's Primavera is right there. Uh, cute dude, nine o'clock. Come on, Linda. Uh, I'm trying so hard. And I was able to get one tear out, but it was the wrong side, and I'm kind of like, and, you know, nothing happened. I go home. Uh, Ten years pass. 
15 years pass and finally alternative cartoonists are invited to this big convention where the real daily cartoonists are. I always wanted to go. And um, so I'm there and I'm starstruck. The guy who draws Beetle Bailey is walking by. Wizard of Id dude is walking by. You know, and then I see Kathy. You know that comic strip, Kathy? And when I saw her, I had to fight an overwhelming urge to uh, just tackle her because she's really thin, she's very beautiful, perfectly manicured, and I just wanted to trip her and go, you've been making your living off of women with asses like mine for too long, you know. <laughs> and so I'm kind of starstruck, and one of my friends says to me, you like Family Circus, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, well, I want to introduce you to Jeff Keen. Jeff, Jeffy, who draws the strip. And I went, Aah! It was nothing that would make anyone want to make out with me. I was like shaking. I was drooling, snot was coming out, and I was walking toward him like this, and he's like, like this shit has never happened to him before, you know? He's all flipped out, and in fact, the, it became such a joke at the, at the conference that all anyone wanted to do was just get him into my line of sight, because I couldn't stop crying when I saw him. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't control myself. And I realized that when I, well, part of the reason was, was that when I shook his hand, I realized I had climbed through the circle. That circle that I looked through when I was a kid, I was there. And the way I did it was by drawing a picture. The reason I'm standing here right now is because I drew a picture. And the reason you all are in this room is because you also have that feeling about this thing called images. I mean, we physically are here, all our molecules, because of images. So now I want to show you some slides, and then I just got to be really careful to not go over. Okay, slides. Oh, uh, house lights down, please. And uh, here we go. Um, this is a little thing that I wrote in my, uh, just in my notebook last month. Poems can make you see the world you are in, as if it could be read like poetry. That is to say, there is a meaning way of looking, a seeing that is new, and something looking back now, alive with you in view, that wants to swallow you. <laughs> what is an image? The formless thing which gives things form. When images come to us, where do they come from? Why do they exist? I say I believe they are the soul's immune system and transit system. Um, so this is a little bit of a mix of my stories. Uh, one of my characters, Arna, goes to the library. She finds a book. It's called Picture This, Learn How to Art with the Nearsighted Monkey. <laughs> the book was laying on a table at the library, and on the cover was a picture of a monkey wearing glasses. And the monkey was smoking, and she had a pet chicken, and the chicken also smoked, but not as much as the monkey. What kind of book was this? Was it a book for kids or grown-ups? The monkey drank beer, played cards, bought lottery tickets. Was that a good influence? Should she check this book out or not? The line was long and Marlis didn't want to wait. The announcement came on. The library was closing. Arna, come on, my show's going to be on. We got to go. Marlis would not wait. Bye, man. Seriously, I'm out the door. So Arna leaves the book in the library. But the nearsighted monkey would not fold. And so I'll read you a little poetry. This is uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Um, Art thou abroad on this stormy night on thy journey of love, my friend? The sky groans like one in despair. I have no sleep tonight. Ever and again I open my door and look out into the darkness, my friend. I can see nothing before me. I wonder where lies thy path. By what dim shore of the ink-black river? By what far edge of the frowning forest? Through what mazy depth of gloom art thou threading thy course to come to me, my friend? While you were sleeping, the nearsighted monkey arrives with her imaginary friend. The staring cephalopod invites you to attend. Please attend. Attend to the back of your mind. There's a song called My Mind's Got a Mind of Its Own, and there's my husband, Kevin, in this picture with me. Um, there's a song... Uh, there's a song called My Mind's Got a Mind of Its Own. What's wrong, hon? Nothing, I'm just moody. How come? I don't know. It's a good way to put it. You want to walk in the grove? Yeah, but no, which means, I don't know. The thing I call my mind seems to be kind of like a landlord that doesn't really know its tenants. 
Who's playing that music? That song I say stuck in my head. Which apartment are they in? Are you worried about your book? Oh, there's my book, the war, the laundry, things I said 15 years ago, the environment, my double chin, unanswered mail, what an ass I am, how dirty our house is. And I've had the song Goodbye Yellow Brick Road in my head for days. <laughs> Where do sudden troublesome thoughts come from? What about you? And he says, oh, for me it's tornadoes, family, all the wood I still need to cut. And then there's this k -tells collection of my 25 greatest screw-ups that I play all the time. And I go, man, I know I'm still cringing about stuff I said when I was nine. Why is there anxiety about a past we cannot change? The top of my mind has no answer for this. And I say, but walking does make me feel better. And he says, movement's key. And I say, I wonder why. There is another part of my mind which seems to not know what year it is at all. I mean, I find myself arguing in my head with people I haven't seen in 15 years, or apologizing, or just trying to explain. It's like there's a place in me where it's all alive. What year is it in your imagination? Does your imagination know what year it is? When I was little, I played a certain staring game that seemed to have invented itself. I'd hold myself as still as I could, and I'd make my eyes like toys' eyes that don't move, and I would wait. I would wait for the other things in the room to forget about me and begin to move. And my mood seemed to have a lot to do with it. I'd have to make myself very calm and very friendly, the way I would when I wanted a shy animal to come to me. And I knew I had to be patient and willing to wait for a very long time. We lived in a trailer then, and any pictures we had up were taped to the walls, and sometimes they fell, but this is not what I say, mean when I say they could move. I believed there was another world that would show itself to me in the smallest ways. The gray kitten in the picture by my bed would accidentally blink his eyes. The girl in the picture would breathe. I believed there was another world, but I only noticed it when it became harder to get to. There had been a time when a toy elephant was as alive as a real rabbit in the grass. I didn't know there were different kinds of aliveness and two worlds contained by each other. Something can only become an illusion after disillusionment. Before that, it's something real. What caused the disillusionment? No one told me that the print on the wall was just ink and paper and had no life of its own. At some point, the cat stopped blinking and I stopped thinking it could. But my memory of the blinking cat is still vivid nearly 50 years later. Why? Why would an image of something which never happened travel with me for all these years? Why do shapes appear in shadows and stains? There's my character, Marlis and Arna. Marlis is going, see there? Boss of everybody, the pirate chicken. Where? By the light fixture. Next car that goes by, you'll see the headlights slide over the pirate chicken. And Arna goes, oh, I just need my glasses on. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Is there a power that makes them, sell, makes them show themselves? Now you, except no monsters. It's got to be something nice. When we see the water-stained creatures, are we inventing them or is the ceiling inventing them? Well, I see Gulita. Oh, stupid Gulita again, man. No, you love Gulita. You invented her. Uh-uh, Gulita invented herself. When I try not to see monsters, they are everywhere. Why has it got to be nice? Because that's the rule. You want to forfeit? And while I was working on this book, um, that was my napkin that fell on the floor. <laughs> so I just glued it in. You know, I really had another page to fill quickly. Um, but there was one of the monsters. What's a story made of? Where is the story before it becomes words? Imaginary enemies are not hard to conjure into being. Adults are especially good at it, able to create them and unite against them for ages. The friends are harder to come by. Singular and elusive, they do not appear for others, and they do not stay. Mine didn't. The memory stayed, but once I knew the blinking cat could not really blink, it was just paper and ink, I never saw my friend again. Not in the outside world, anyway. But paper and ink have conjuring abilities of their own. Arrangements of lines and shapes of letters and words on a series of pages make a world we can dwell and travel in. I traveled up the mountain as Heidi. I slept on a straw bed in the hayloft and heard the high wind in the trees, and I despaired for my future there, not knowing what was to come. I remember it like it happened to me. I suppose you could say that it did. There are certain children who are told they're too sensitive, and there are certain adults who believe sensitivity is a problem that can be fixed in the way crooked teeth can be fixed and made straight. And when these two come together, you get a fairy tale, a kind of story with hopelessness in it. And I believe there's something in these old stories that does what singing does to words. They have transformational capabilities in the way melody can transform mood. They can't transform your actual situation, but they can transform your experience of it. 
We don't create a fantasy world to escape reality. We create it to be able to stay. And I believe we've always done this, used images to stand and understand what otherwise would be intolerable. It seems that human beings everywhere understand that a child who is never allowed to play will eventually go mad. But how do we know this? And why do we know this? And what happens when we forget? So my mother, um, who's from the Philippines, uh, as you know, uh, went through, she was half American, and uh, during the Japanese op uh, occupation, um, she, she survived the bombing of Manila and lived in hiding throughout the war um, and um, had a, a lot of difficulty with people, um, I think, a lot of, because of that. So who does war belong to? Who does natural disaster belong to? Who does death belong to? And that's my mom. Oh, I hate that airplane sound. How come? You ask too many questions, you know that? You talk too much. And there's a little watercolor of the bombing of Manila. What happens to the unspeakable? What happens to the unthinkable? What is the past? Where is it located? What is and where is your imagination? And when we imagine things we don't want to imagine, why can't we stop ourselves? What is a memory? My response to a series of well-known disasters and the unexpected deaths of several friends was a confusing compulsion to paint cute animal pictures. In particular, the meditating monkey. First drawn while crying in an airport bar en route to a funeral, I found it helped and I drew it again and again. I've since painted hundreds more, maybe thousands. There's always a pathway that's lost. My mother found comfort in coloring books after the war, even as a young adult. She was balanced when she was hand coloring, not happy, not sad, free of that. Color crayons and hand motions over pictures of cute animals made a way for her. Is making a picture and coloring a picture something other than art? What's the difference between drawing and singing? In terrible times, people sing. Things can be said no other way. Mourners sing, and music makes a way. It's not a way out, but a way in. Where do you go when you color? Where can the brush take you? It can take you to the singing place. There is a place where characters dwell, and it's not in thinking. Scrooge and Hamlet are there, along with certain toys we played with. Superman and Batman are there. Sherlock Holmes is there, and King Friday and Lassie are there, and Eleanor Rigby is there. And when we are all gone, perhaps we'll be there too, alive in the image world again and again. So I've been really interested in um, working with adults who have quit drawing, and they come to my writing class thinking they're coming to a writing class, and I make them draw. And one of the things I have them do is draw, uh, a, we did this with some students today, um, where you fold a piece of paper into four, four quarters, and then I ask you to draw, back, <laughs> draw a car for two minutes, then one minute, then 30 seconds, then 15 seconds. And then I ask you this, to do the same thing with Batman. And so these are some of the pictures that uh, people left behind. Let's draw a car and let's draw Batman. There's something beautiful in the lines made by people who stopped drawing a long time ago. And there's something curious about how scared they are when I ask them to draw a car for two minutes or one minute. It's an exercise from Cartooning Philosophy and Practice by Ivan Brunetti that I sometimes use during the first part of a workshop I teach called Writing the Unthinkable. Draw a car, even if you don't know how, to see what happens. And what usually happens is a kind of involuntary laughing that sounds like the laughing of people who are about to enter a spook house ride. Just how scary is this going to get? Um, your car begins to take shape, and the shape it takes seems out of your control. And there's a thrill there, and a terror too, that becomes especially evident when I ask people to stand up and look at each other's drawings. All we did was draw a car, but the room feels like it's on fire. Why? Some of the cars are quite far out, and some are barely there, like phantoms made of ghost lines. Others are more certain, and some seem to feel their way in. The same thing happens when I ask them to draw Batman. Sometimes somebody knows just how to do it, but mostly they are not sure of the way. But they only have a limited amount of time to do it, so thinking it over doesn't come into play, and a natural kind of picture comes about, like this, and this, and this. Hold on, I'm getting a butt buzz. I know, man, my students would totally be uh, out of my class if they did that. Um, and people are dismayed by this and even ashamed enough to destroy it immediately. But what if the way kids draw, that kind of line we call childish, what if that's what a line looks like when somebody's having an experience by hand 
a live wire. There's an aliveness in these drawings that can't be faked. And when I look at them, that aliveness seems to come into me, and I'm glad to see it and feel it. Real aliveness of line is hard to come by. When someone learns to draw, to render, it's the first thing that goes, the aliveness. And it's what some artists spend their whole lives trying to get back. The spook house and the merry-go-round are two different rides. When we say a kind of drawing is good, we may be talking about a certain kind of ride everyone can understand. Although the thrill is gone, it's nice, a ride on the merry-go-round. But then there's that other ride, the spook house, the one with all the not knowing that both scares and delights us to bits, to little bits of line that are the tracks we traveled on while screaming and laughing because we have no way to control the outcome. And we're in motion anyway, creating some kind of energy that still runs through the drawing, even after we've lifted our hand away. The pictures you see here were made by 35 adults who were together one afternoon in the fall of 2012. I asked them to leave behind any drawings they didn't want. I colored them in, you power them on. So I've been working at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, hanging around scientists, mostly interested in how they use line. They're um, geneticists, physicists, and mathematicians. They draw on everything. Every surface at this place, WID, we call it Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, is covered with their drawings. And I started to get very interested in the quality of line, uh, especially like these guys are brilliant, when somebody's getting an idea. And at the same time, I had a project where I was going to um, asking people to draw pictures of what they think university and school will look like in 100 years. So that's a scientist drawing. This is a second grader's drawing. The second grader says, the classrooms will be inside rockets that can go in the air and underwater. Scientist, second grader. Everything in the class turns to candy when you come in. The teachers are candy, the students are candy, the desks are candy, and then everything goes back to normal. <laughs> Scientist, second grader. There will be a giant steel tent for the school and a lot of windows and they'll have the playground on top and there'll be an elevator to the play playground. Science, second grader. Tall, tall buildings with many, many classrooms. You have to parachute to get out. It will be haunted, so we'll have to study at night. There will be in some caves in the side of a mountain, and the principal will be in the basement watching everything on a computer, and there will be gymnastics. <laughs> You'll have to be really smart to get into this school because none of the doors will be doors and none of the windows will be windows, and there'll be so many suns and moons all out at the same time. This is gianter than it looks. The tubes are a mile. You float in them to get to the different rooms. There's 10,000 classrooms. And I like this one. I think it's going to be a castle. Well, it's a volcano school, and it erupts to get the students out. <laughs> this is another one I like. Half pink, half orange. That's the prediction. But again, science drawing. And here is a drawing by Carl Sagan when he was a young man, well, he was a kid. And it's a poster where he's trying to recruit people to come <laughs> to be on his spaceship with him. And, and it says, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Have you ever said that rhyme? If you have, and if you're interested in joining the crew of a spaceship, contact your local ISS office nearest you, young men and couples from the age of 22 to 32 years old in top physical condition are welcome to apply. No ladies, please. No single ladies. <laughs> Scientist drawing. This drawing. This is, drawn, this is a drawing by Felix Bumgardner when he was five years old. Some of you will remember him. He was in the news recently. He set the world record for skydiving, an, ex an estimated 24 miles, reaching an estimated speed of 834 miles an hour on 14th of October, 2012. He became the first person to break the sound barrier on his descent without um, power. That's a drawing he did when he was little, and his mom saved it and gave it to him after his big jump. Tagore is a, a Bengali poet, story writer, composer. When he, um, I loved finding his original manuscripts, and when he wanted to knock things out, he just started drawing. So he would write a poem and then black out all the parts he didn't want or turn it into a bird. And this is the, one of the first drawings ever of a, drawn of a neuron. It was drawn by this guy, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And there he is, and he's a, he was a Spanish scientist, the first guy to uh, see a neuron. That's his little um, office there, his lab. And this 
It was drawn by Galileo. Yeah, like the Galileo. Um, and there, um, those are his little drawings of the moon, the first time anybody was able to draw the moon. Do you wish you could draw? Do you wish you could write? Do you wish you could sing? The nearsighted monkey is cooking up a plan. So Arna, in the beginning of the book, she comes back. She's never able to find this book again. And the library closes, the, bro the, the branch library closes. So here's the final strip. It's called a branch library, and they are small compared to the main one, which is too far to walk to. Dang. See, I told you, the library closed as of August 31st. Weird to see it so empty, like it's always been that way. No trace of Granny or Mrs. Kedzo or anybody library-ish. There's only a plant in the window and it's dying. Marla says, oh man, another case of window plant tragedy. The librarian was talking about it the last time we went in, how all the branches were cut, her and Mrs. Kedzo saying things are drying up. There's no one to say goodbye to, but the figurine stuck in the planter still reading a book like nothing had changed. Goodbye, you stupid elf, says Marlis, and then she looks at me and asks me why I'm crying. There's a letter in your mailbox. When you see it, you say, oh no, but she is on her way now. The nearsighted monkey is coming to visit. Art thou abroad on this stormy night on thy journey of love, my friend? The sky groans like one in despair. I have no sleep tonight. Ever and again, I open my door and look out on the darkness, my friend. I can see nothing before me. I wonder where lies thy path, by what dim shore of the ink-black river, by what far edge of the frowning forest, through what mazy depth of gloom art thou threading thy course to come to me, my friend. All right, now I'll tell you the joke. And uh, can I have a, like these little stage lights on my mystical, see I just loved that. I just, I would like to be able to say that wherever I went. Just say, okay, stage lights, please. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a joke and then I'll do a party trick and then you could go. The joke, I live in, it's, this, is, this part's not a joke, I live in rural Wisconsin and my closest neighbors when we first moved in are this um, retired couple who introduced themselves as Donovan and Joni Mitchell. They, that's their real names, Donovan and Joni Mitchell. I thought they were messing with me. I'm like, yeah, I'm Victor Mature. This is my husband, Clay Eastwood. What do you mean you're like Donovan and Joni Mitchell? And Joni's one of those Wisconsin ladies who likes a good joke, a little naughty, not too naughty, but a little naughty. And... Um, she always has one for you, which I love that idea. I have one for you. So she comes, she goes, Linda, I got one for you. You know, there was this lady, and she had this dog, and oh, she loved her dog, but that dog snored so bad, and she wasn't able to get any sleep, and she didn't know what to do, and she went to the vet, and the vet said, you know, I've heard this, it sounds kind of crazy, but you can take a ribbon and tie it around your dog's balls, and he'll quit snoring, and she's, I'm not going to do that. Um, so she goes home, and it's time to go to bed, and she gets in the bed, and dog goes to bed and he starts snoring and she says oh what the hell so she goes over gets her ribbon bag out takes out her red ribbon and she go, the dog's named chainsaw and she goes and she ties this ribbon around his balls and he quits snoring she can't believe it she goes back to her bed and lays down and oh she's sleeping so nice a little while later, in comes her husband, and he's been out with the boys. And he takes off all his clothes, and he falls into the bed, and he starts snoring. And she says, what the hell? So she goes over, and <laughs> she gets this blue ribbon. She goes, and she ties it around his balls, and he quits snoring, too. She can't believe it. She has the, oh, she has such a good sleep. And she wakes up the next morning, and she feels so good, and she goes off to work. And a little while later, her husband gets up, and he's pretty hungover. And he goes to take a pee, and then he looks down, and he sees this ribbon around his balls. And he looks over at Chainsaw, and Chainsaw's trying to get the ribbon from around his balls. And he goes, Chainsaw. You can tell I'm, I don't really know how to do this part, but Chainsaw. <laughs> uh, I don't remember where we were or what we did last night, but by God, we took first and second place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice joke. <laughs> it's a, it is. It's a lovely joke. It's a good Wisconsin joke. But, he, but, but if you think about what a joke is, here's what, what a joke is. All a joke is, is imagine this, imagine this, imagine this, now imagine this, and your body goes like that. What the hell is that? I mean, what is that? 
And, and also the state of mind that you have to maintain in order to get that joke is this, is this very open state of mind. You can't listen to what I'm saying and go, oh, or tying a ribbon around a dog's balls won't do shit. I mean, you can't <laughs> do that. You have to, in a weird way, hold your mind open. And, and that, I think, is the, is, is the back of the mind. That's the state of mind that when we approach any kind of creative work, um, that's the state of mind that you, need to, um, that you need to have. And I think that the arts are so much more than decoration or an elective or something somebody's very good at or someone's very bad at. I think it has everything to do with our feeling that life is worth living and we ignore it at our peril. And now I will do my party trick. I can sing without moving my lips and I'm gonna do it for you. Um, it takes two years off my life Every time I do it, but if that's all right, if you watch me, it takes four off of yours. So, um, <laughs> and those of you who have seen me do this before know to cover exposed flesh. Um, okay, so, okay, and this, but I am singing a song, and, it, and it's from the image part of me to the image part of you, and I mean it with all of my heart. And I want to thank you for being such an incredibly warm group of people to speak to tonight. So here's my little song. Excuse me. My sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy when skies are gray. <laughs> you never know dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine. Thank you, thank you.